Hello, uh, I'm Igor Stoppa. I work for uh, Huawei at the Research Center in uh, Helsinki. I've been doing this for uh, almost two years. Uh, most of my work uh, has been about uh, memory protection, and that's what I want to talk, you, talk to you about. Um, this presentation is a sort of uh, diary of a journey because uh, I'm still working on this. Um, some of the material in the slides is kind of already outdated. Uh, I wake up every morning finding <laughs> something saying, you're wrong here. Uh, I will fix it. Uh, if you think that I'm wrong on something that I haven't found out yet, please let me know. Um, so let's see where it all started. Um, too many presses. Uh, I work for Huawei. Uh, Huawei amongst other things, does mobile phones. So not surprisingly, I care about mobile phones. Um, in certain areas, uh, you do not have access to the Google Play Store. So if you are a user, you have to find from somewhere the application and install it. And that opens the door to every sort of uh, malicious attack that uh, usually users from the Google Store might not see. So it's kind of taken as granted that uh, there will be malicious software on the phone at some point. Uh, what we would like to do is to at least prevent uh, uh, the worst from happening that the user information is leaked. Um, we have seen a set of attacks. Uh, they mostly go against SE Linux because SE Linux is one of the security features used by Android and uh, it seems to be the common stepping stone of all of these attacks. So the idea is uh, if we can uh, somehow prevent that, uh, we have already hampered a class of attacks, no matter what the vulnerability that uh, uh, might be exploited in a specific product. But then the next question is obviously, uh, can we use this technology also for protecting something else? Um, there's also, we can call it a sort of uh, uh, side, nice side effect, which is uh, uh, very protection does not only work against uh, attacks, but it works also against bugs. Um, the difference is that uh, uh, for bugs, everything is good, everything is fine. You do not have to really aim for total coverage. Uh, whatever you get uh, is good. But uh, if you have an attacker, then uh, you have to look at the whole chain of trust, basically. Uh, you might have a 95% coverage, but that 5% is what the attacker will go after. Um, working with upstream is rewarding, but it's also tough. I have been looking for an example, and I have to say that uh, it's good because looking for an example also forces you to question your own choices. Uh, the initial example was SE Linux and LSM hooks. But the sad reality is that uh, SE Linux has a very complex uh, data structure and uh, LSM hooks are constantly moving target. I mean, I think every other one or two releases, there's a huge patch set trying to alter them. So it wasn't good for me to keep it as an example because I couldn't spend my life uh, uh, rewriting patches for, SC, for uh, LSM hooks. Uh, enters Mimi, thank you for uh, uh, proposing the IMA list of measurements. It's so much simpler compared to the SE Linux data structures, um, and it's kind of more stable. Um, it also was useful to point out that the API I had chosen uh, at that point uh, was not just not good enough. At least I couldn't make it work. So that also provided a bit of variety in my uh, analysis of what can happen. Um, SE Linux policy DB, which is what I was protecting initially, has a sort of uh, initial transient during which it loads a bunch of data, creates a lot of structures, allocates stuff. But after that, it's quiet. You can mark it read-only and nobody will notice. Uh, turns out that it's not the typical case for kernel code. IMA is a much better representation of kernel code, where you might have something which happens uh, seldom, but it does happen all the time. For example, with IMA, if you are looking at uh, uh, measurements for files, every now and then you might want to add a new measurement. Uh, it might not be performance critical in terms of uh, that specific addition, but it means that the memory cannot become completely read-only, because 
the way the measurement list is implemented is uh, through a link list. So every time I add a new measurement, I need to modify a pointer in that list. And this takes us to the right rare uh, functionality. Uh, initially, it was only for dynamically allocated memory because that's what uh, IMA was doing. It allocates a bit of memory and then adds it to the list. Uh, yeah, what's the meaning of right rare? I think it's uh, highly subjective because uh, what is rare for me might not be rare for someone else, and uh, what is acceptable for me might not be acceptable for someone else. So in that sense, uh, the idea is that uh, it is provided as a mechanism, and then uh, every potential user has to make a choice analysis on whether it's uh, suitable or not for that specific use case. Uh, more uh, learnings from uh, IMA. Um, not only dynamically allocated memory needs to change every now and then, because for example, if I have a list uh, of dynamically allocated memory, there is in reality a statically allocated head which I need to alter at some point to append something. So write rare needs to work also there. Um, and since we are talking about lists, what I initially started with was a sort of a really bare bone version of write rare where I was dealing directly with uh, uh, pointers. But it turns out that this is extremely painful. Uh, what you want to have is some sort of higher level abstraction and guess what? You want it to look a lot like the abstraction that you would use uh, for non-protected memory, which in practice means uh, having an uh, alternate version of uh, uh, the functions that the kernel already uses. So let's have a quick look at uh, what is available right now. Um, this should be a surprise for nobody, but I just wanted to list it. So you have uh, a few ways of protecting statically allocated memory, but the uh, sad thing is that uh, when you move to dynamically allocated memory, there's nothing. Uh, that's where pmalloc, which was my initial idea, came in the picture, because SE Linux uh, uh, uses dynamic allocation for most of the memory uh, it requires, because SE Linux doesn't know uh, how big would be the set of policies it needs to accommodate. And uh, as I explained earlier, also uh, statically allocated memory needs to be, uh, to have a right rare support. By the way, I found out this morning that uh, PRMEM is not a good choice because it can be confused with PMEM and it could even be used in the same context. So if you have a proposals, are welcome. Um, the difference between read-only and write-rare seems obvious, but it's not, I think, at least. It wasn't obvious to me till I had some uh, soul-searching uh, thinking. Uh, read-only is final. So when you say make this read-only, that's it. Uh, there's no way back. So you are just saying, I, will, I am giving up any future choice, uh, possibility of modifying this. But when you do write-rare, Periodically, you are touching something that should not be touched. So the question is, uh, uh, how can we be sure that uh, the one trying to modify it is uh, legitimate? However, from a perspective of hardening, I think it's still usable or useful. Um, quick overview of the protection mechanism. So typically, uh, x86, uh, uh, ARM-based system, they have a MMU, and the MMU is what can be used to protect memory. Uh, MMU works at the page level, so what doesn't work is uh, if you just allocate some memory from a page and want to make it uh, read-only or write-rare, and from the same page you get some uh, writable memory. Uh, it can be made to work if you really, really want it with uh, some hypervisor trick, but it's gonna cost a lot. Uh, it's much more uh, convenient to split at the beginning uh, writable memory from a protected memory, so that whenever uh, somebody tries to modify protected memory, this will trigger an exception. So the MMU comes in the way only when something bad is happening. In the normal case, the MMU will not generate an exception. 
And we have two ways to do this. One is only with the kernel, and the other one is a kernel plus something else, which can be hypervisor, T, you name it. It doesn't matter. It's just something which is not kernel. Um, the first case with the kernel only, the really bad thing is that the protection can be undone. So current hardware does not have uh, any one-way option to uh, say, I do this once, and uh, I will never take it back. So if the attacker manages to run uh, or to modify data at kernel level, the protection can be undone. However, even in this case, uh, from a hardening perspective, it still reduces the attack surface, which I think is better because uh, we are moving from having basically every bit of memory as a potential target to focusing on the page table, for example. Um, in the case with the hypervisor, it's kind of easier if you happen to already have a hypervisor handy because uh, the kernel is much more limited in what you can uh, do. And uh, basically, the hypervisor is what the kernel can use to relinquish permanently its capability. The downside is, of course, you need to have a hypervisor or capable hardware. And if you think about uh, IoT class devices, that might not always be the case. Um, but there are some cases where the hypervisor is there already, for example, in uh, data centers, cloud providers, some mobile devices. But even your regular laptop or PC supports uh, running hypervisor usually, so why not? It could be used even in regular distros as an additional hardening form. Uh, I'm borrowing some uh, naming from uh, Git. So the base of uh, uh, this protection is what I call PRMM. So the requirements are reads must be fast, or at least there shouldn't be any uh, noticeable uh, decrease in read performance. And writes for the write layer case should be acceptable. We already discussed what acceptable means. It's probably subjective. And since Linux doesn't run only on system with, system with uh, MMU, it also needs to work when there's no MMU available. Um, for the dynamic allocation case, uh, I'm using vmalloc as backend. This allows to be sure that as long as there is a system memory, the allocation will not fail. And uh, it uses logical pools for the perspective of having um, properties that are assigned to the pool, and then every VMA which is allocated uh, for that pool will have the same properties. Uh, it's a kind of trade-off uh, between uh, uh, kmalloc and uh, vmalloc, because vmalloc basically, every time it's uh, invoked, uh, allocates one or more pages and gives those. That means that uh, and every page will use a TLB entry. Uh, so if you allocate five times uh, 10 bytes, that will, that's going to cost you a lot in terms of TLB trashing. Uh, on the other hand, kmalloc uses uh, a huge page mapping, typically, so that basically is free. Uh, this solution is uh, kind of intermediate, because it reuses the free space that was uh, uh, available from the previous allocation. So if I allocate uh, 10 bytes from a page, the next allocation will use whatever is left from that page. Um, the implementation of uh, write rare for uh, uh, static uh, allocated memory is not so different from uh, read-only after init. Uh, the major difference is that uh, read-only after init uh, can piggyback more on uh, constant data because uh, they kind of go hand in hand. Actually, at least on some architecture, they are very protected uh, simultaneously. Um, Write rare intrinsically has a different uh, uh, write history, so it cannot be treated the same, especially if because of ARM64. ARM64 uses huge mappings, while for uh, uh, write rare, I would like to use as small as, as possible mappings to minimize uh, the area which becomes writable when I have to modify something. Um, there's a version which is uh, what I have posted uh, uh, to the kernel mailing list uh, without hypervisor. And uh, as I was saying, it's supposed to use small pages to prevent uh, uh, 
completely getting the system stuck. It does not uh, disable interrupts uh, on the whole system, but only locally on the CPU, which is executing. Uh, what it does is uh, it gets a new random uh, address, remaps the page, which is very protected to this random address, which should be harder for an attacker to identify, performs the change, and then uh, destroys the mapping. Uh, all of the functions implementing this are uh, in line uh, with the hope that this reduces also, in that case, the um, attack surface from, from an attacker, meaning that uh, it should be possible for the linker to do better and the compiler to do better optimization if all of this is in line. The hypervisor case is easier in a sense because uh, I don't have to worry about mapping. The hypervisor can have uh, its own mapping. It doesn't care if the kernel is having an interrupt or not. Uh, it's still good to inline the functions which get to the point where the hypervisor is uh, invoked. Um, this is what uh, I have uh, implemented so far of plumbing. There is some discussion ongoing about uh, whether it should be like this or not. I do not have an answer. I guess that's the point of asking for review. Anyway, the, my takeaway is uh, uh, I need uh, a very rare implementation of the basic functionality, mem copy, mem set, uh, uh, assignment of a pointer, uh, handling of an uh, atomic operation. Um, the, these are nice side effects. Uh, for example, now that uh, certain type of data, which we know is supposed to be more valuable, that's why we want to protect it, lives in certain areas, we can use this knowledge uh, to enhance uh, hardened user copy coverage, because most likely that data we don't want to, well, it's already very protected, but probably we don't want to let user space even read it. And uh, currently, I'm not really releasing any memory, so it means that uh, use of the free attacks are kind of impossible on this, because even if uh, there is some bug which uh, tries to use memory which was uh, freed, it will still be there, because uh, once it is given, it's never taken back. There's a different use profile of the TLB. I haven't measured it, so I cannot say how much good or bad it is. I suspect it's gonna be a bit worse, but I do not know how much. Um, this is another thing that has received a crossfire from various direction, but I will talk about it anyway for now. Um, what I wanted to achieve uh, was to have a compatibility between the, let's say, normal uh, read-write version of a certain data structure and the write-rare version of it. Uh, I wanted to recycle uh, the reading code because since it's uh, write-rare, that doesn't say anything that cannot be done with reading. Uh, the key part uh, is that uh, more of this needs to be atomic, uh, in the sense that uh, I want to make it so that uh, one page uh, remapping is sufficient. I do not want to uh, have uh, some data crossing a page boundary, some simple type of data. Uh, that was a lot of words. This probably explains it better. So on the left side, uh, there's the typical version of the data structure. On the right side, there's a, a PR version. In reality, it's just uh, a lot of code uh, to access the same data in different ways. But at least uh, it should give the compiler the notion of what is uh, right protected and what not. And the alignment is such that uh, uh, one of these pointers does not cross a uh, page boundary. Um, I have already converted, uh, and they seem to work, uh, various types of lists. Um, what I might be doing next, uh, if uh, my proposal is not fully, completely rejected, is the uh, object cache. Uh, why? Because, for example, if I want to apply write rare to the AVC cache in uh, SE Linux policy DB, uh, that one uh, uh, allocates and releases a uh, lot of nodes, so I need to, I cannot just uh, eat up memory forever. Um, Said so this, there are two ways of uh, using write rare. 
uh, one I called chain, which is probably the most obvious one, and the other one is looped, which is something that I found in uh, uh, Samsung code. Uh, chain basically means that you start with a statically allocated pointer or some data structure, and then uh, you have one or more uh, dynamic allocations which follow. And this is really a sort of chain of trust, and you want to protect it all, because uh, if you leave even one link out, that will be the target of the attack. Uh, this is more complex, but for example, it is used by uh, Knox for, prote for protecting LSM. So let's say that you have uh, a data structure with some fields which are writable and some fields which are, you want to protect. So what you do is you split it, put in a specific area the part which you want to write protect, uh, and uh, only structures of that type will belong to that area, and keep elsewhere uh, the writable one. The writable one has a pointer to the counterpart, which is write protected, and the write protected part has a pointer back to the writable one. The cost of this is that before the referencing, what I put here as a P1, it needs to be uh, validated because uh, attacker could write anything there. So this is a case where write rare has also a read overhead. Basically, I need to verify that that P1 points to the area where the structures might be, and that it's also aligned to where the field uh, that points back should be, or, or the parent structure. But it's a way of having a sort of a floating protection that doesn't require the whole <coughs> chain that I showed in the previous slide. So again, once more, choosing one or the other really depends on the use case and how complex it is to provide a full chain versus uh, taking the overhead of uh, validating before reading the pointer. Um, this is a example of protection code. As I said, uh, the validity of this is volatile, might change soon, but it, for now, if you look at it, the green uh, uh, part of the code is what I have added, and I think it doesn't look too alien. Uh, there's a initial uh, uh, modifier to specify that the variable is a write rare after init. Um, there's a declaration to actually. There's a declaration of a pool. The pool is a way to specify properties for the memory that will be allocated. And then uh, it shows that instead of writing size equal five, I use wr underscore int to set that value. The reason is that uh, uh, this does the magic of writing through the secondary mapping. <coughs> Peak alloc uh, is just uh, allocating some memory. And then uh, uh, the last instruction is writing to the pointer, uh, to the actual pointer, the value of the memory, that was, the address of the memory that was allocated. Um, this is a bit more complex, and I'm not sure I should linger too much on it, also because it's part of what is being uh, currently challenged. Um, mostly what I would like to say is that uh, I am trying to reach a point where uh, it is really explicit uh, uh, if I'm doing something with protected memory rather than not, while the comments I got from uh, various uh, uh, people from, up, from upstream are that uh, I should kind of uh, make it happen uh, behind the scene. I do not know. Maybe it's me trying to get someone to convince me that I should write less code, which is not bad. And this is a similar case. So in practice, uh, uh, the takeaway is, again, uh, where I have to read, I can just uh, look at the same data structure from a different, from a different angle and I can reuse the existing functionality, so I'm still using each list uh, unhashed. While uh, for uh, writing or altering the list, I have a new function which is a PR H list del in place of the normal H list del. And the assignment also uh, of the null point pointer happens to uh, through a specific function. Um, 
Current limitations, uh, I still have to get it to work uh, with uh, ARM64. I have it working, but it's through the hypervisor. I do not have it working without, because I probably need to create a separate section with a different mapping. Uh, but I hope I can tackle that. Uh, I need to write a lot of fallback uh, code for the no MMU case. Uh, and then uh, I cowardly avoided uh, writing any test case for uh, RCU and uh, Atomic because they're really complex. Uh, at this point, I was just trying to get uh, something which would kind of work from end to end so that uh, I could use it as a base for a conversation. And I think I got that far. Now that's the more grueling part of getting it to work for real. Um, as a disclaimer, I'm not claiming that uh, it's all good. There are things that uh, I know do not work or can be attacked. Uh, as I said, uh, right now, even with the hypervisor, uh, you do not really know for sure who is asking you to modify something. So if the attacker is smart enough, can use the system against itself. I've actually seen this sort of attack described in some slides against a uh, uh, Nox phone. So I'm not saying anything new. Um, the metadata used uh, is also could be used for an attack. Um, so that might be possible to protect, but uh, I'm not sure how yet. Uh, MMU page tables are also something that could be attacked. But again, the goal is uh, if we could reduce the attack to surface do you MMU page tables, for example, that might be incentive to hardware designers to think about something that would make it harder to attack those. And uh, there's the usual problem with uh, randomness that uh, if someone manages to drain your uh, randomness pool, then it becomes easier to guess uh, where the next write uh, will be mapped to. Um, there are performance limitations. If, for example, I want to append or insert a node in a list, I have to deal with uh, four pointers. Right now, I'm doing it on them one by one, also because uh, uh, first I wanted to get to the point where there's good confidence that uh, the write rare base mechanism works. But the point is uh, I am going four times through remapping or possibly hypervisor calls. This has a performance cost. Ideally, uh, if I have something which is used a lot, and I think uh, lists are a very good example, then it might be worth uh, to promote them in a sense to become intrinsic write rare functions instead of uh, depending on uh, some more basic function like uh, a sign pointer. Um, yeah. What's next? Uh, Yes, I have to fi fix uh, the static right rare after init uh, for uh, ARM64 and uh, the fallback. And the test case is uh, then the problems I just described. Uh, probably vetting the call path is something doable. Um, the metadata is questionable because it's not only about the metadata that I'm producing with the Pimaloc pool, but also the metadata that comes from the Vimaloc areas. And that seems to be in a completely different class of difficulty. Um, this is the optimization I mentioned earlier. The drawback of that is that basically whatever becomes sort of intrinsic uh, function then needs to be implemented also on the hypervisor side. So it would be nice if there was some sort of uh, data library that could be shared in both cases, but I don't know how much that is possible. And assuming I have uh, any spare time, uh, this is what I would like to do. Um, SE Linux and LSM hooks, they go kind of hand in hand. Well, in reality, I think uh, protecting any Linux module requires also protecting the LSM hooks because, as I mentioned when I was talking about chains, LSM hooks is, again, something that is always in the way, and it's useless that you have a very hardened module if uh, it can be just unplugged. Uh, for SE Linux, the policy DB is kind of easy. I've already done it, but it's uh, 
not something that I have submitted upstream. Uh, AVC, I have tried it without write rare, and I managed to make it become 10 times slower, so that also I'm not going to submit. Um, containers might be a nice use case. Uh, I'm, unfortunately, I don't remember the name of this person, but someone was trying to submit a patch for LSM hooks to try to improve uh, uh, the, the support for containers. So you can have read-only hooks for the main execution environment, but you could have uh, write rare for everything else that is in a container because that's something that you can destroy. Does it work? <laughs> it seems to, although, again, this morning it was pointed out that uh, I'm doing something nasty with uh, interrupts disabled that I shouldn't. I have to look into that. Uh, but there are also two types of uh, uh, does it work. Uh, I think so far it's also reasonably usable that uh, it can be used to convert existing code. I think that that's a major point, that uh, if I come up with something that uh, works but nobody wants to use because it's insanely complicated, then I haven't achieved much. Uh, for sure, I think we can agree that it reduces the attack surface and maybe even more it makes the system less prone to undetected uh, memory corruption. Uh, hypervisor, yes, is the magic. Uh, uh, I think it's coming one way or the other. In reality, a lot of uh, Linux uh, applications do use hypervisor for very different reasons, but it's there, so I don't think we can ignore that it's there. <coughs> so we should take advantage of it. There are, there is a possibility that uh, control flow attacks can sidestep all of this. I don't have an answer for that other than I don't think it's possible to make it completely bulletproof. One thing that I think is good uh, is the fact that uh, it's opt-in. So if you feel that your system uh, can use it, good. If not, well, maybe next time. Thank you. Um, as a reference, uh, um, OK. I suggest that you do not look at uh, my patch set because this is really ugly, but uh, what I sent to the mailing list is a bit less ugly. Um, for your convenience, I have put, uh, these are, were just uh, one huge tarball. So what I've done, I have downloaded the publicly available source code uh, from uh, uh, Huawei and from Samsung, and I put it on GitHub. You can see there uh, some of the things I mentioned. Uh, if you really want to see how we are protecting SE Linux now, you can see it there. And you can see the LSM protection from Samsung. Mm -hmm. And that's all. Questions? Thanks for your talk and for this research. Uh, you mentioned the problems and that you can't understand whether the color of the right function is valid or not. Yes. Maybe the control flow integrity can give partial answer to this. So uh, it enforces that only um, the callers from initial uh, source code are able to call your function, and it restricts the, the number from which you can call the writing function. Yes, um, the control flow integrity is one thing uh, definitely doesn't hurt. One problem is that uh, there are, I've seen various implementations and uh, each of them uh, can be kind of sidestepped in some cases. So I think it's the same problem with security in general. You might have something that is nice to have, but you cannot trust it that it will fix all the cases. But yeah, for sure, anything which uh, hampers the uh, alteration of how the flow of the program should be is good. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe just a small reminder to for poor asked questions, please introduce yourself so that people can find you if they're interested to. David Helms. Uh, I would like to know what are the vectors by which this overwriting is actually happening? Because I've heard stories about Android having secret files which provide access to memory. Are, are these being um, used? I, I'm sorry. I, it's true that uh, I work for a company which makes phones, but uh, 
what I work on is what you've seen. <laughs> so th there might be something, but uh, I cannot answer this question. So historically, there was Dev Exynos mem on certain devices, which allowed you to do that. There've been um, other things that vendors have put together where they've not thought very strongly. Sorry, Mark Rutland. Um. <laughs> One question, there is somebody. Hi, uh, Tycho Anderson. I'm actually one of the people who complained about the, um, but I like the work in Please. general. So, uh, <laughs> Bring it on. I just was wondering, like, you could use CFI. You could also, like, even as just a first attempt, do like a sort of a setfs style thing where you say, okay, I'm about to enter some code which is going to cause a fault. We're gonna, we should allow this to be mapped writable and then unset it later, just as like. You know, I know that this specific little bit of code is going to write to um, not writable memory, and I know that this other little specific bit is. But in general, now I, I will protect against all of the other write anywhere primitives that exist outside of these little specific bits of code. So you get, you know, a lot of this without having to wait for CFI or anything else. You are proposing a sort of whitelisting of uh, functions which can. Uh well, yeah, I mean, I guess I was thinking of it's just like a global bit that you enable and say, I'm about to do some some activity that's going to cause a, a fault in writable memory, but it's okay. Do the fault, remap it as writable, do your access, then go back to the regular code and then unset that bit. So then in normal execution, if there is a write to this place, then it faults and things panic or whatever. So what we protect that bit? Uh, like something else, I don't know. It's just another, <laughs> another level. Um, I mean, so again, if the the bit itself is is write protected, then it's you have to be able to call a function and write. Yeah. Well, the, 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 there are. I mean, it's kind of becoming a philosophical uh, sure. problem. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Totally. But but the the problem or the, the reason why I'm not so fond of something global is that basically you are giving. Uh, a real clear point of attack that is easier to identify. Yeah, but uh, you also don't have to duplicate every data structure in the kernel, so. No, well, I I'm wondering, is there a better way? So please take my proposal as uh, something which is a conversation start. I'm not saying uh, this is the truth and uh, I think I know better. I'm just saying this is a way to do it. Uh, how can we do it better? The, um, the pain is, as soon as you start protecting larger and larger structures, you end up going, oh, wait, I need all of the list handling functions dealt with, and now I need all the atomics, and yeah, it's trying to find the middle ground, I think, is where it's going to be tricky. So I think uh, we better stop here, so maybe we can take more discussions. So let's thank the speaker. Yeah, thank you.